Hi, this is Terry Hawkins. Well, welcome to the Studio Success Formula Podcast, the business school for dance studio owners. And now for your host, Clint Salter. Hello, dance studio owners. It's Clint Salter here from Studio Success Formula, and thanks for joining us on today's podcast. Now, five years ago, I attended an event for business owners, and the last speaker for the day blew my mind. Since then, I've been lucky enough to attend her live events and get to know her on a more personal level. She's been responsible for transforming businesses and lives across the globe through her training company, People in Progress. And today, I'm beyond excited for her to be sharing with us concepts that will change your life and business. My guest today is one of the top 60 speakers on the planet, a go-getter, a loving mother, and all-round hard worker. Please welcome Terry Hawkins. Thank you, Clint. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for joining us. Now, Great. if you haven't heard of Terry, she's a best-selling author and founder of People in Progress, her training company, which just celebrated its 25-year anniversary. She's a pioneer in developing leading training programs and presentations that support teams and businesses in really finding their gap and achieving their goals. Buckle your seatbelt and get your notepad out as this interview is is going to be life-changing if you let it. Now, Terry, I want to jump right in. And for those listening who have heard of you or been lucky enough to work with you, would be aware of your amazing Pitman, Flipman keynote presentation. But for those who are not aware of these characters, I'd love for you, for you to give us a brief rundown of this concept and why you created it in the first place. Okay. Um, Well, first of all, I created it because it actually was just an evolution. And I think when you've got a business, um, you know, great concepts or products or whatever emerge when you start to see a need or you're not fulfilling a need. And I, this is years and years ago, and I couldn't work out why some people would just be amazing. I was doing sales training and I couldn't work out why some people could be just so brilliant at sales and others couldn't. And yet both of them had the same experience, the same circumstances, basically the same everything, but one would fly and the other would die in the bum. And that um, sparked my passion for looking at human behaviour and what's, and also with my own background. You know, why was it that some of us can have the most horrendous upbringings and yet go on to succeed, you know, amazing things and yet others can get a pimple on their chin and, you know. The world's over. Three. Exactly, <laughs> honey. Where's that clearer still? Um, and so I, so Pitman and Flipman is my way of explaining, I suppose, the antithesis of ourselves when we're either in the defeat mode or when we're really rocking it. And Pitman is basically a metaphor. And so it's Pitman, he lives in the pit of misery. Mm-hmm. And it's a, it's a fun way of describing a really toxic and dangerous place that a lot of us go to. And so I'm not talking about um, genuine emotion here. I, I actually love genuine emotion, which is grief, sadness, appropriate frustration, appropriate anger. Um, the trouble is what we do is we tend to push all that down and then our pit emotions come up. And when you're in the pit, it's basically where you just feel like you want to give up. You can become very aggressive. You blame everybody. You know, everything's outside of you. If your business isn't doing really well, it's because of the industry, it's because of the customers, because of your your staff. And where as flip man is where you basically flip it. So it used to be called stick man. And then I came to the United States, of course, and someone had trademarked stick man over here. And I was devastated. And I ended up through just being really resistant to wanting to change it, um, to end up having to change it to flip man and end up being the best thing that ever happened because you basically flip the pit. And so you uh, you flip whatever you're feeling, thinking, and, you know, whatever negativity that you've got. So it's actually teaching people about the process of the brain because so many people think that they can just get motivated. Like if I just get motivated, I'll be okay. Or if I can just have enough passion, you know, I'll be all right. Yeah. And, of course, that's, that's not a passion and motivation and not a strategy. And when you can recognise what it is that you're seeing, what you're, talk, you know, saying, what you're feeling, then you can actually see why what you're doing isn't working. And so I use the four processes of see, say, feel, and do. So see it, make a visual, say it, say it out loud in really powerful dialogue and feel it, which is the most important one, feeling yourself into action. And most of us get feel awkward about that. But, you know, Flipman is all about feeling what you might feel 
when you had what you want to have. Most of us wait until we get it and then we think that we'll get the feeling. And I go, no, it's got, it's got to go the other way. You've got, you've got to fake the feeling before you actually get it. And, uh, and then, of course, when you do those three, the doing part unfolds before you, the, you know, all the things that you need to do. So I found it worked in my own life. I actually created Pitman because I trained two teenage boys who killed themselves because of their high school leaving result. And it just floored me. And because I had been there, I had, you know, as a teenager, I had also tried to kill myself. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, how it just devastated me. These two beautiful boys took their life because of a stupid piece of paper that they thought to find them. And I just drew it in training. I drew that hole which because I knew I'd been, you know, I knew what it was like. And then over time it just developed into Pitman. And, uh, and so now we have these two gorgeous characters who are now in children's books and, you know, I'm looking at having them animated over here, hopefully into an animated series. and Fantastic. Adults, yeah, everybody knows them. Like, I mean, it's like you, you know, it's five years. I have people 15 years ago who will go. I was at the Qantas Club one time and this guy yells out, hey, pit girl. <laughs> <laughs> And I was at the bottom of the escalator and I looked at him and I said, were you in the audience this morning? And he goes, no, I saw you years ago. I said, well, it's stick girl to you. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You've gone through that process now. It definitely should be stick girl. (laughs) <laughs> so, Terry, if someone, you know, is listening to this and they've recognised that they might be having a bit of what you like to call a pit party um, and it's been lasting a little bit long, you know, can you give us one strategy? And I know you've got your strategy around see it, say it, feel it, do it. You know, what would you say to that person if they've recognised that, you know what, that's been me for a little while now. How can I get out of this? Well, the beautiful thing about being in the pit, because we all go to the pit, the of beautiful course. thing about the pit is that it gives you contrast. And so I always say, don't put a full stop, put a comma. So when you say, oh, my gosh, I hate my life because I'm fat, comma, so I'd love to be healthy. I hate my life because I've got no money, comma, so what I'd love to do is have financial independence. And so you, whenever you're getting what you don't want, you're also getting really clear about what you do want. And then I say, then get some momentum. Now, what a lot of people do is they earn $10 an hour and they stick a Ferrari on the fridge. (laughs) <laughs> and every time, isn't it? They come out and they go, oh, Every morning, but, every morning they look at that vision board on the fridge of the Ferrari and go, I'm gonna, that Ferrari's going to roll down the hill and into my garage. Yeah, well, in actual fact, what happens is they're, because your brain knows. So your brain goes, you idiot, you get 10 bucks an hour. It's going <laughs> to take you four lifetimes to get that Ferrari. So yeah. by looking at the Ferrari, it actually has the reverse effect. So the best thing you can do if you haven't got a car is to put a bomb on the car, on the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if, you, if you're overweight, is to not stick skinny mini on the fridge, it looks like Old McPherson, but to actually have a visual auditory and kinesthetic association to the next step. So it might mean, mm. well, I'm not going to tr- go for a marathon, but I can walk around the block. And then every day you get a little bit, you tack a little bit more on, tack a little bit more on. It's like if your relationship's in the toilet, you don't go to a, you know, romantic spa for the weekend, nothing's going to happen, but you might hold hands for five minutes you might sit in silence but watch a movie side by side you you take step by step by step and eventually what happens is you don't just take five steps those five steps join together to create momentum Um, before you know it you're you're at your goal yeah exactly and I I think what you're saying there is you know it's all around that taking that small consistent action daily Mm -hmm. exactly because it's so easy it's so easy to be lazy you know, it's, and people try to cover it up with all this other, you know, great, and I'm a bit of a brute that way. I just go, really? No, let's just be honest. Let's just be honest and say, no, you shove those seven donuts in your face. No wonder you're feeling like crap, you know? Exactly. Mm. Say, say it how it is. That's, that's, that's great advice. Thank you. Now, we've got many business owners who are listening today, so I'd love for us to dig into your philosophy around sales. Your cell training program, which you and your team deliver across the globe, talks about the fact that we don't spend enough time building relationships and rapport in the sales phase, which means that obviously the close is a, is a lot more challenging. So what recipe do you teach when it comes to sales? Well, I mean, we do a lot of programs. So we have sell, we have care, we have best. And the premise that you're building there is that it's all about trust and every relationship is about trust. Now, I think what a lot of us go into sales for is to get a metric. And I'm on this big thing for the last 12 months about how businesses are metric mad. Mm. And everything's about measuring. And so 
measuring comes from the industrial revolution and you know at the turn of the century we needed to measure things you know you had people putting widgets into boxes and and it was a command and control society and of course we have highly evolved human beings operating now and you have people who it's actually a conflict it's a, it's a it's incongruent for the body to go okay well i know this the way to see, have a successful sale is to create trust with my customer but on the other side i have my company bashing me around the head going make a target make a target make a target mm-hmm. and so the person goes into the sale with conflict because their own intuitiveness knows well let me create a relationship here and the only way i can create a relationship is to get to know you to build trust because you're not going to buy from me unless you trust me but if i've got this this desperation to make a sale hanging over me the customer intuitively picks up on that and then that's why we don't have the connection so our big thing is about metrics don't motivate of course you need metrics i mean you know you're not going to play soccer without the goalpost there exactly otherwise you know everyone runs around going oh that was a good feeling yeah um, <laughs> you know and i've even said that to some sales people you know i'll go how are you going and they go yeah great and i'll go how do you know and they'll go oh it just feels really good today and it's like well a feeling's not going to get you anywhere so you have to measure but the measurement is from the past so when you measure it's it's already done it's already happened and you're what you're doing is you're taking that measurement from the past bringing it into your future and then you project your fu- into your present then you project your future so we our belief is to that meaning motivates so what's the meaning behind your sale what's the meaning of having this this connection with a customer and if you just wait up front just slow it down we actually turn the triangle on its head mm-hmm. and so you know the old way of selling was you know just greet them really quickly the greeting was almost just like a formality you know yeah. talk about you know if you're selling you know business to business or going to people's offices you know you make a comment about the kids on their desk and and you'll see people do it in stores actually where they'll greet you but it's not even a they don't even look at you their their eyes just glass over yeah. and they think that greeting the customer is a sentence e- e- exactly and it's not yeah, I was in um, Westfield over the weekend. Um, Kev, they're a client. And, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> um, but in one of their particular retail stores there, and I remember from my general pants days when you were doing the training there, you know, and they said, you know, greet the customer within 30 seconds. In lots of the stores, the staff were amazing and engaged in conversation and, and it was great. But there's still a few of those stores that we went into and they're like, hi. Mm. Hi, are you are you right there? <laughs> I was like, oh no, you're fine. Keep talking to your friend. <laughs> I know it's one or the other. It's it's they're dead from the neck up, mm. or they greet you to attack you. Yes, and so there's no and it, and I go, God, stop! It's amazing how we will try to we take the same formula and we try to cut it up and repackage it and rebrand it and think it's going to work. But it's not going to work. It, look, our customers are more evolved. People are becoming more and more intuitive. They sense it. So I always go, the greeting is a feeling. It's a mm. feeling. It's a connection. So, so yeah, so I just think with sales, I think, you know, you have to rethink how you go about it and, you know, create some meaning because you cannot drive a business by the metrics. I have been saying that for years and years and years. Um, and slowly but surely, you see, when I say it to CEOs, for example, you see the penny drop and then you see fear in their face because they realise, well, how do we change this culture? Mm, how do we turn this around? Yeah, they've built this culture purely on, on the metrics and bashing their salespeople over their head with their numbers. <laughs> yeah, and I say to them, people will not leap out of bed to sell a TV. They're not going to jump out of bed to sell a lipstick. They're not going to ju- go, yay, I'm going to sell life insurance today. They will jump out of bed to, sa- to, to uh, change a life. They will jump out of bed to know that they've made an impact or made a difference in someone's world. And even in a retail store, they can still have the most amazing connections with human beings. And I don't know about you, but I could not do my job if I did not have some sort of deeper meaning behind it than... Yeah, so do you think that that's about getting back, you know, getting back to your why? You know, whether you're a small company or a large company or a CEO, you know, why is it we're doing what we do. I I do believe that, but I I also even think with the whole why, because we've been doing the why for, you know, I mean, so were you you at General Pants? Did you used to work at General Pants? I was at General Pants when I was 16. Uh, I was a casual, uh, I was a casual there for about four years. 
I knew there was a, I knew, I, I knew that we connected at, you know, that conference five years ago and that yeah. we've been in touch ever since, but, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, well, so we had you and Amber and, um, yeah, you. and I've still got lots of friends from my general pants days as well, which is great. <laughs> yeah, which is fantastic because, I mean, that was, that they were amazing days when we were doing the training there for about 15 years. But the thing is, if you think about it, so we, the purpose, so we would talk about you have to find the customer's purpose. But if you, if you look at it, you didn't have to say, you didn't have to, scientifically or intellectually sit you guys down and go, okay, now what's your why? Why are you waking up every morning? You knew, didn't you? You knew you wanted to be a part of this dynamic company. You're part of a great team. You went to have fun and then you wanted, you wanted to share that fun. The, the why became the, that, that actually just happened because you were there wanting to actually help the person standing in front of you, whether it was one of your teammates, whether it was a customer, it didn't matter. And so, I think there's a lot of marketing around this whole find your why and what's your why and, yes. and I love all of that but yeah. I go settle down, let's not make it a branding opportunity, let's just really deeply contemplate what is the difference you're making every day, what is it, you know. Like when, you're, when I make pikelets for my kids, I don't just slap a bit of batter on the fry pan and flip them over. I go down the shop and buy them. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you get them. You, you get them delivered. <laughs> exactly. But no, no. I, I beat. I, I whip it with love. You know. I pour them into the. You know, when they were little, I make it into their little letters. That's what we're talking about. It's like mm. when you're, if you work in a sandwich shop, you can have just as much joy from your job as someone who is, you know, doing hard operations. Yeah. I love that. I love the premise around that as well. Another thing, you know, as business owners, we're continually coming up with new ideas, programs and services for our customers. And so from the clients that I've worked with, and I know you've worked with many, many clients over the, the 25 years that you've had people in progress, you know, we often make the mistake of giving the customer what we think they need instead of what they actually want. How, what are your thoughts around this and how can we rectify that problem? Well, I think this one sentence that I'm about to say is, to me, it's how I've created every single program I've ever written. And I've written, I've developed, oh gosh, I can't even begin to, you know, 40 one-day programs, five three-day programs, you know, all these half-day programs. I've done numerous speeches. I've written children's books. I've, you know, come up with concepts for companies. In your relationships, it's the same sentence. If you want to have the most amazing relationship. And it occurred to me one day that, if you just find out what people want and give it to them, you, will, you can't help but be innovative. You can't help but come up with relevant, you know, current ideas because what you're doing is, and people, they'll, they'll go, oh, okay, fine, I'll just ask them. Let's do a survey. And I go, no, come back to what's your motivation behind it. So if you actually sit in deep empathy and empathy is my favourite word on the whole planet. Yes. Um, which I've been, you know, sprouting for since I was 20. <laughs> since, since you were probably born. Oh, I tell you, I just love it. When you sit in a deep contemplative state of empathy, so if you can imagine, wow, this just came to me here. Can you imagine a marketing team? So they're wanting to come up with new ideas for their business and you've got them all into a room and you've got them to actually just contemplate, close their eyes, maybe play some soft music in the background and just had them sit in the space of their customer and empathise and be their customer, not be the company, but be the customer using their products. And what, would it, what, what might it look like? I guarantee the ideas drop in like they're coming from heaven. It is unbelievable. The trouble is most of us, we try and do it blindfolded. And so we, we guess what the customer wants and then we come up with these, you know, and then people say, we did this customer or this market survey and I go, just sit down and be still and A, have the conversation. So with it, in your relationship, if you just say to your partner, what is it that I do that makes you feel loved? Now, some people have to sit and be with that. Or what is it that I say? You know, or what is it that I, whatever, you know? And the person may need a little bit of time, but they might say, you know what's funny? When, you, when I go into bed at night and you've turned down my side of the bed, I feel really loved. And you might think, wow, I only did that because the sheets were too tight. <laughs> but, but it's those little thi- it's those little things yeah well it's just going tell me what it is that you want and we'll give it to you so I, all I did with my, my, my care program which is still one of the most powerful retail programs on the planet I believe I said 
what do you hate when you come in? They told me. What do you love when you come in? They told me. And so then I developed a program based around that. Mm. And that's it. And it just, it's a winner every single time. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It is because, you know, we all have so much in our brains and want to extract all of this intellectual property into services, programs, products, whatever it might be. And uh, I see it so often with, with clients that I work with that, you know, they, they produce something that they think and the team thinks wonderful and then they take it to market and, and no one bites. No one bites at it. So that's, yeah, that's wonderful exactly. advice. Exactly. It's just slow it down. It's not that hard. And you know why else? I think because companies compete with companies. They forget what they're there for. They try, you know, you'll hear them say, I was at a conference recently overseas and the, the, all I heard them talk about was competition. And I said, the more you focus on the competition, the more you're going to bring it to you. I said, what makes you special? You have to find out what makes you special. Why do your customers love you so much? It was a pharmaceutical company. And they so got it. They so got it. They were like, oh, my gosh, look at our languaging. Everything's about how can we be better than the competition? Let's look at, look at our magazines. You know, so you have, uh, you know, or our television, sh- uh, com- uh, our television stations. One of them comes up with a story and then guaranteed five minutes later they've all got the same story. Yeah, exactly. Mm, it's good. It's imitation, not innovation. Yes, yes, 100%. Now, I love the story you tell about you starting People in Progress 25 years ago. Congratulations on the anniversary as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fantastic. And, and you started the company with $167 and no networks. I'd love to know if you were in the same situation today, uh, mm-hmm. what would you do first and how would you spend that $167? Because I think the, the business landscape has changed probably quite dramatically in those 25 years. So what would you do now if you're in that situation? I would buy the best bottle of wine, sit down, drink it and forget about it. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. And go to sleep. Exactly. Just have a lie down and this too shall pass. No, look, I, when I started, it, I di- really didn't, I, look, I didn't have any grandiose ideas about starting my own company. It was never my goal to be a business owner. My goal was to train people. And so I loved that the business just happened because of the passion that I had. And quite often you will find successful people. I don't know if you remember Samantha Wills. She was a surf dive and ski years ago. And uh, she now has the most amazingly successful uh, uh, jewellery accessory business and stationery and uh, she operates out of New York and she's just incredible. And she did, uh, she was selling the jewellery out of the back of her car and she did the care program with, um, when she was at Surf, Dive and Ski and she said she never forgot the, t- the line that I, you know, the t- name of my first book, There Are Only Two Times in Life now and too late and I really believe that if if you have a, a, a bigger I'm just trying to say this because I'm trying to in, uh, incorporate all the different businesses because even if you're selling donuts you know it's it's what was the reason where did that where did that buzz come from and I was 21 when I actually had the idea of having my own training business and I thought to myself oh, I'd really love to have my own training business one day and and have three or four clients and then work with them one or two days a week you know and and that was it I didn't have any intention of being this business owner. So the $167 was all I had left after I had been retrenched. And I was sharing a flat with a friend. I had written the program that I wanted to run with Central Park and they were the ones that had gone broke, but we had tripled the productivity of the girls. So I knew that the program worked. I had no money. I had just moved to Sydney, whatever it was, uh, 12 months before that or 18 months before that. So I really didn't know anybody. It was just through sheer mistake. So what I would do, right, if I was to start a business today, mm-hmm. I would make sure I had good cash flow. Now, sometimes you, and sometimes you don't need cash flow. No money makes you sell really quickly. You know, so I door knocked. I, I had that Yellow Pages phone book out. I was calling every day, 20, 20 places a day. I was sending letters out. You know, I, I re- and I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't, it wasn't yay every day. It was almost throw up in the toilet every day. And so I would make sure I had good cash flow. I would also, what I, like what I did, I didn't have, I didn't need an office. I didn't have any other, need a business card, didn't need this. People go out and go, right, I'll just get my beautiful office set up and then I'll be ready. And I go, no, save your money. Don't waste your money. I walked, you know, I caught buses and I walked and, you know, I did it really poor. Now my business was in profit within, you know, two months. So I was very fortunate, but, um, 
But I've got to tell you, it's been a rocky road at certain times over that 25 years. And, you know, there, are, there were times when there was no money and I didn't take a salary. You know, I made sure that my staff got paid first. The other times when, and now those times are very few and far between. But when I came to Australia, you know, my presence not being in Australia was felt. And so the business started to go downhill. Meanwhile, I'm bedridden over here with an illness that I couldn't, you know, got. No one knew me in America. And so my the money that I had accumulated just basically flew out of the window over a three to four year period and I ended up losing everything. Someone said to me when I was here, they said, what's the best part and the worst part about starting up in another country, especially America? And I said, my memory. Because I re- the best part is I remembered how to do it. I know, I know how, what it takes to actually create a very successful business. Yes. The worst part is I know how hard that can be and how hard you've got to work. And I work my little butt off and I have done for 25 years you know when people say to me I said to someone the other day you know sometimes I get tired I'm 53 now and I still love what I do and I still will stand in front of a crowd and give them every ounce of my soul but I do get tired and uh and so I suppose I would if I were to give anyone advice I would say make some really good financial decisions you know, and who can, how do you know what's, what's a good financial decision? You know, I had this stupid financial controller who said to me, financial planner, I mean, who said to me, I just split up with my former partner. I had sold an apartment and, uh, and I was waiting on money from my former partner. And he said to me, Hey, I'll tell you what, don't pay it off. Don't pay off your house. Let's just take that 500,000 and we'll put it into the money, into the, the stock market. That was in July. And in August, we had the crash. Yeah, right. And so I lost, you know, I literally mm. lost $500,000. I, mean, I think I got, you know, $64,000 back or something. So I look at it and go, you know, sometimes you're going to make decisions that you think are right, but they're not. But at the end of the day, Clint, honestly, I have loved every moment. You know, even the darkest moments for me have been the most empowering. So, you know, you're in it. You're not in it. I, I'm not in this business to make money. Do I want to be financially free? Yes. Do I? It Does the financial side drive me at times yes I get a buzz when we when we make a big sale but I the biggest buzz I get is knowing that thousands and thousands of lives will be transformed when we go into a company so 100% and those emails and letters that you you know that you've talked about that you then get from changing and and having an impact on those people's lives gosh I just said I was interviewed yesterday and this guy said you know how do you what makes you stand on stage? Because it's really quite a judgmental place to be, especially coming from a childhood that was incredibly judged, you know, from, you know, the sexual abuse and the violence and, you know, the poverty, the, I had, you know, the warts all over my body, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, he goes, how do you do it? And I said, you know, I, I hate the first 15 to 20 minutes. I absolutely hate it. Like literally, my, I could feel like I was dying. And I said, but I know, just like you said, Clint, I'll get an email from a kid who's 14 saying, I was thinking of killing myself and I decided not to because of Footman or a man who says, I, I went home last night and he looked at my wife for the, differently for the first time in years and we're starting again. And a business will say, you know, we were about to close up and now we, you know, we're the number one office in, you know, the whole country. And I'm, they're, they're the stories that I go, girl, even if there's one person in that audience that needs to hear this message today, that's why you came. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, we've kind of touched on this, but life's challenges don't escape any of us. And I know how strongly you feel about plugging our own holes instead of searching externally for the fix. And I hear people say, you know, when I get a pay rise, then I'll be happy. When I find a loving partner, then I'll be happy. You know, how can we fill our own holes and become complete from the inside out? Well, I love that. And, you know, that was very much a a me ink thing, you know, the yeah, because which, I, had that, I had that realization. Yeah, I had that realization where I just thought, "Wow, if I took all of this away, would I be enough?" And and I think the journey of self is the journey of a lifetime. And uh, and I think you're right that we project it outside of ourselves and we make it somebody's somebody else's responsibility to make us feel complete. And I had a lot of holes. You know, I when I when I and when I say holes, just for the people who are listening, that when you're little and someone criticizes you and you you drill a hole into you. Um, Maybe you were abused at some point, you know, and you drill a hole into you. I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough, whatever it might be. And then you take those I'm not enough into your adult life and it translates into 
So I need a partner to make me feel validated. I need money to make me feel successful. I need, you know, to look gorgeous in order to feel whatever. And that's filling the holes from the outside in. And so I believe that you need to do some, you, no one can avoid doing the work and we're all here to do our own work and work in a beautiful sense, not in, a, not in an effort sense. But the, the, the journey of self to me is one of the most exciting, challenging, scary journeys ever. And I always go, if you spend all of your energy, not all of your energy, but if you focus on just discovering you, the beautiful you, fall in love with you, and that's how you'll fall in love with a gorgeous partner. Everyone that you bring into your life is just a projection of where you're at. You know, it's like, um, like I look at Jackson. So my 15-year-old and I were having a few challenges and I was traveling so much with my work and he felt so alone and he was here in America and he was right, you know, and I kept going into justification of, well, you know, I'm the bread, you know, I'm the only one that makes the money and, and I always have, I've always been the breadwinner and there was this little boy basically standing there at 15, nearly six foot saying, mom, I need you. And I came back this time and it was really ugly and, you know, he was so hurting and, you know, I said, how can you hate me so much? And he goes, you have to know someone to hate them. And I was like, oh, my God. And so I remember standing at the top of the stairs and I went, I'm, I said it out loud and I said, I'm going to be the best mother I possibly can be while I'm here till the next time I travel, you know. And I made, made dinner one night and we sat there and he wouldn't look at me but we sat at the table in silence and then we, he started watching television so I sat with him and he didn't leave but we sat in silence and that was my journey. That was my journey to allow me, me to let my son have his feelings and his reactions to me as a working mother and instead of tooting the old victim, you know, I work hard, I do this, it was, no, this is a consequence of the choices that you've made and you have to sit in the pain of that and watch your son as he journeys his way out of this, you know. So that's how, that's how I do it. I'm just, you grow and then you rest and then you grow and you rest and you grow and you rest and you just never stop. Yeah. That's thank you for sharing that as well. Uh, do you think you know the concept? A lot of people, you know, speak about you know how do we have it all? And and you're a, a parent, a successful business owner. You, you travel a lot. I mean, what what does that concept mean to you of having it all? And and is that uh, possible? I, I, your your questions are fantastic, Clint. I'll just give you this. One of the things I think that we do. This is another marketing concept. Great. Having it all. Yeah. I go, what the hell does that mean, having it all? I have got it all. I have. I've got, I've got children who I love and they love me. I've got a business. I'm financially stable once again. I have my health. Am, can I do it all at the same time? No. <laughs> no, of course I can't. What I, but what I can do is wherever I am in that moment, right then and there, I can serve that person, whoever that is, to the best of my ability and not rob one moment for another. And so when I'm not with my children, I'm in Australia or, you know, wherever, Portugal, oh, I'm so sorry, um, Portugal or wherever, then I cannot pollute that person or that group with the sadness of wishing I was at home with my kids. And when I'm with my kids, I, learn, I have learned to be present Mm-hmm. Like, like I drove down to see Harrison and he goes to University of San Diego and I was with him, you know. We went shopping to Costco. We went for dinner and, and I wanted to talk to him about my life and I just, my head was going, shut up. Just be present with him. Just be with him. And, it's, and that's when you get, the, you get the beauty of the moment. So having it all to me is just appreciating everything that you've got in the moment because I don't know what that term means. I think it's. You know, yeah, women, I, do it, women do it like they go, you can have it all. I go, well, no, you can't. Like you, you can't be a 100% present mother physically and a 100% businesswoman and a 100% friend, and a, yeah, but you can be a 100% present when you're in those, each of those areas. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes, it makes complete sense. And, you know, I'm a big advocate for living in the moment. Sometimes it's really difficult. You know, I, I know that mm-hmm. I find it difficult uh, as much as I, I try and focus my mind and, you know, and, and meditate and, and do the things that I think serve me well, you know, there are those times when you're, when you have to kind of just be aware of, okay, you drifting back in the moment, back in the moment, that constant reminder. Well, and then you throw kids into the mix, um, and a partner, and then all of a sudden, and then, and texting, you know, how easy is it to just... <laughs> Oh. To be sitting there with your phone beside you and you're watching, you know, 
some movie and then you, you know, do the little side glance to have a bit of a look to check to see your emails. Of course it is. And that's what I meant by, you know, we beat ourselves up a lot. I think just be honest and just ask yourself, am I fully present with what I'm doing? And if you're not, just like you said, you just bring yourself back. That's all. Yep. You touched on health there. And I know, you know, I noticed that, you know, you are looking very fit at the moment, Terry, thanks to Facebook for the photos. What, you know, (laughs) What, uh, you know, what kind of health, you know, you're a speaker, you travel a lot, you run a global company. I mean, how do you look after yourself from a health perspective? You know, do you have any little tips or rituals that you could fill our audience in on that work really well for you to keep you, uh, I guess, operating at your, your maximum capacity every day? Well, I, I love that I look fit and I could, I could quite easily just sit here and pretend that I'm the, you know, the amazing person that I'm not and so I I'm a I'm very I'm a lot healthier than I was two years ago and I was very very sick for about five or six years and when I even photos on my website that are old photos I notice it now that my you know I was very puffy I had that autoimmune disorder and and I was really really not well so I think the comparison of that to now that I've got my levels all balanced and I've got an amazing doctor and but I don't I'm certainly not your you know I certainly don't wake up and have you know, muesli with blueberries and yogurt, and I'm a bit of a Starbucks fan. I love bananas. Bana- <laughs> bananas get me through. But I, and I, I, yeah, I don't eat a lot of crap. You know, I drink very little. You know, I didn't actually drink for about twelve years. And, I was going to uh, say, yeah, I thought um, I didn't think you drank at all. Well, it, it became a bit of a pain because people would actually assume that I was an alcoholic, and not that. And I, you know, obviously, I'm not saying anything there. In my, my book, I talk about that, but. Uh, and, I, and then I'd have to start justifying it to people and it started to annoy me a little bit and uh, we were in Mexico and two, I was with a group of friends and two of us got virgin drinks and the rest got alcoholic drinks. And this guy he, and this friend of mine, a beautiful man, he was an alcoholic and he said, he goes, oh, yum, try this. And he had a mojito. So I, had, I went, oh, yum. And then I said, here, try mine. And I had a virgin pina colada and he goes, oh, yum. And then after he'd finished the drink, he goes, gee, he goes, I feel like I've got the buzz that I used to get when I used to drink. And I went, oh. And we're all laughing, going, what's oh, a placebo effect? And so then the waiter came over and I said, oh, I said, could we have another round? I said, and they, these two were virgin drinks, weren't they? And he goes, no, no, the mojito was full strength. <laughs> 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 and so he just has a heart attack and goes, oh, my God. And so I just said, oh, look, how long has it been? And he goes, you know, 16 years or something. And I said, right. I said, so you've got the neural pathways. I did the whole flip man thing, yep. you know, that are so strong now that it's irrelevant. It's not even going to matter. And then I went, oh, no. And I went, God, I had a sip of that. I said, you, I've broken my record because mine was all about my record, you know, that I hadn't had a drink for so long. And, and I had a friend telling a friend and she goes, what are you going to get at the end of it? And I went, sorry? And she goes, are you going to get a medal? You're going to get someone stand up there and go, Terry Hawkins has not had a drink for 12 years. And I said, no. And she goes, then lighten up. And it was really interesting because I, wow. I, yes, what came to the surface for me then was, wow, I'm a little bit scared of, because when I gave up drinking, I was having a couple of glasses every night and it was a really dark period in my life. And it was just, before, it was a couple of years before I split up with my husband. And I was scared that maybe I would have the same attachment to alcohol and, uh, and of course I don't, and which is great, and that's a, that's a lovely thing that sometimes going and looking at your, you know, your past in the face can be really rewarding. So, so yeah. So as far as health goes, I try to do the best I can. But yes, I have not felt this good in years. So thank you. Fantastic. Now you've been an inspiration to to not only me, Terry, but to many other business owners and individuals across the globe. What keeps you waking up each morning wanting to play a bigger game? Well, I think the first thing I want people to know is that I do not leap out of bed every day going, yay for life, you know, let's bring another one on. I have been driven curiosity and the healing of my own issues. I was lost for many, many years. I had I brought with me into my adult life a lot of unresolved stuff from my past. And then in doing that, in, in and, and also in wanting to help others. So because of my abusive childhood, I became almost like a natural carer. Quite often if you've been abused, you get a caring role that, that grows within you. And so that carer in me really loved helping people. I loved seeing people grow. And then I, then I started to realise how powerful knowledge was. And then if you actually implemented that knowledge and did the things that you learnt, 
how amazing you could start to release things and you could start to, you know, things that, th- that you were fearful of before weren't that way anymore. And so, so now at 53 years of age, what gets me out of bed now is that continual journey and, and also difference. Like I like to shake it up a bit and, uh, and I have two children. And I've got to tell you, when I was very sick, they were the reason I, cl- I crawled out of bed. I mean, I was bedridden for about 10 months. They were my rock. Like, I-, I can only imagine how hard it must be for people who are single and don't have any dependents. I often say that children are a good excuse not to suicide. And I know that, and that's not a joke. You know, mm. chill, I can see how it can get very dark for some people and without someone there relying on you, you know, people can make some really dumb choices. And so, so for me, it's... Uh, days I don't want to get out of bed. Some days I leap out of bed and love my life and I've accepted the fact that life is full of contrast and now if I, if I wake up and, and I'm heavy or I'm anxious or I'm frustrated or I'm scared, you know, whatever it is, I now will sit in the place of going, wow, where is this coming from? How did I create it? And I go to the root cause rather than sit in the anxiety, if that makes sense. You know, like I'm, yep. I'm a bit of an explorer now. So, so that's what gets me waking up. And probably, yeah, like you said, wanting to play a, not a bigger game, a more insightful game, a more mm. fulfilling game. You know? I love that. Thank you. Look, Terry, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, speaking with you today. And if our audience want to get some more details on you and, and people in progress, where should they head to? Well, they can come to my website if they like, which is because uh, we're in the process of uh, rebuilding and about to launch our new People in Progress website. But uh, my website is just Terry, T E R R Y, sorry, it's Australia, isn't it? T E W R Y, Hawkins, H A W K I N S dot com. So Terry Hawkins dot com. Excellent. Thanks so much. It's been lovely to speak with you. Thanks for sharing. It's always a pleasure with you, Clinton. Keep doing what you're doing, honey. You're just, you're an inspiration. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Studio Success Formula podcast. To take your studio to the next level and beyond, head to studiosuccessformula.com.